Joining me now, John Della Volpe, MSNBC political contributor, director of polling at Harvard's Kennedy School Institute of Politics, and a leading expert on young voters. We're going to get to all of it. John, welcome. Look, we have been looking at Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin as critical blue wall states. But how could North Carolina and, Obama and o Omaha, Nebraska factor in? I mean, for example, is North Carolina, is it a must-win state for Donald Trump? For Donald Trump, it, it all depends, I think, uh, Alex, and thanks for having me, really about the blue wall. I think we start with the blue wall states first, okay? And if Kamala Harris wins the three states, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan, she's currently according to the aggregate of polls, up by between one and two points in each of those three states. If she can win those three states, it's over. If she loses Pennsylvania, and again, she's up by one, it's a virtual tie there. If she loses in Pennsylvania, if Donald Trump can win Pennsylvania, then the pressure is on Harris to find another pathway to 270. There are multiple pathways here, though. One of the one one of the obvious ones that's been getting a lot of recognition, especially because of the governor's race, as you said, is North Carolina. But oh. North Carolina has 16 electoral votes. Pennsylvania has 19. So it needs to be North Carolina plus another state, plus Georgia, plus Nevada, or plus Arizona. Okay, uh, it's always such a you know it's like a chess board when you try to figure all this out. Um, let me ask you: so she wins either North Carolina or Georgia? And keeps Pennsylvania. Is that it? Does That's she win? That's essentially assuming. If, I think the conventional wisdom, Alex, is if she wins Pennsylvania, it's not mm -hmm. guaranteed. The conventional wisdom, if she wins there, she can win the rest of those Rust Belt states, Wisconsin and Michigan. So it's about a combination of those three states first. That's why they call those the blue wall. Those are the states that Trump won against Hillary Clinton in 2016, that Biden won back in 2020. And over the course of this campaign, Democrats had have had a slight advantage in each of those three states up until this point. OK, um, let's get to the youth vote, because you conducted recently new focus groups of the voters under 30 years old. And you found that VP Harris has got about a 31 point lead over Trump among registered voters. But what more can you tell us, John, about these voters? Are they newly registered? Are they signing up to support one candidate or another? Are they registering in swing states? So how about all those questions? Sure. Well, th that data is actually, I've done a lot of focus groups lately, but that data is actually from the Harvard Youth Poll. It's much more than a focus group. It's, it's a survey of more than 2,000 young Americans. And what we can see from that data is just a few months ago, when President Biden was on top of the ticket, he had a 13-point advantage. And today, among registered voters, as you can see, Kamala Harris has a 31-point advantage. Mm -hmm. And what I've said for many, many years is, it's, 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 it's basically essential for a Democrat candidate to get to that 60 percent point with young voters to stand a chance at a electoral college victory. So she is well on her way there. If she can hold that, she will be in good shape. But when I talk to younger voters, I see a couple of things. One is I see in the Harvard polling as well, increasing levels of enthusiasm and likelihood to vote among younger Democrats, whereas younger Republicans seem less enthusiastic than they were just six months ago, which is something we rarely find. People less likely to vote, but we're seeing that among younger Republicans. But here's the important thing, and you can't just conduct surveys. I really think to do our job well, Alex, you need to get into the states and, and talk to voters, specifically young voters. And when I talk to them, I hear three things. Number one is I hear this pervasive sense of struggle that they have, this instability in their life, so much of it connected to the economy, Young voters, their, many times their first experience and memory is the Great Recession. And now, 15 hmm. years later, they're dealing with economic struggles, one, pessimism about the future. They talk about things being bleak, scary, unclear. They're looking for some strength and some hope. And third is all of this, I think, is, is affecting their mental health, and it adds anxiety wow. and strength. So okay. um, I'm hopeful that the agency will lead them to vote. Can, can I get just a quick yes, no, maybe in terms of their reliability is actually going out and voting? Yes, we have record turnout in 2020, and I think we'll be close there in 2024 as well. Okay, sounds good. Uh, John, thank you so much for joining me. We'll look forward to seeing you again, you and your chessboard there that you're sharing with us.